Luke chapter 8. We're going to look at something. I, uh, Luke chapter 8 is, is a fascinating chapter in the Word of God. Uh, it starts out with, with a series of, as Jesus, as this passage began, it starts out with uh, Jesus going from village to village preaching the Word of God and, and, and demonstrating to them about what the kingdom of God was all about. And uh, there was a group of women who followed him, as well as the disciples. And it talks about these women and names these women in verse, verses uh, 2 and 3 of chapter 8. And it says that they uh, ministered to him out of their means. These were women whose lives had been transformed uh, by Christ. And as well as these 12 disciples, Jesus was training and teaching, preparing them uh, for the ministry that was to come. Now, gets down here and then it begins to teach on the parables. The next thing we find is the, the teaching on the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower. And so he, he teaches that parable to his disciples. And uh, they didn't get it. Verse 9 tells us, disciples asked him, saying, what might this parable be? They wanted to know and understand what this parable was. And so Jesus reveals them, tells them what it is. In verse 11, the sower went out, he's sowing seed, and he wants to make it clear to them that this seed is the word of God. Now, the Apostle Peter said that we are born again, not with corruptible seed, but with incorruptible seed, that is, of the Word of God. Now, so we know that that Word is incorruptible. It's pure, holy, righteous. Uh, one of the things that the devil has really worked hard at is to corrupt the Word of God. Even in the days of the early church, the Apostle Paul said we are not of as of many of those who corrupt the word of God. So there's a lot of people who work in the early church even to corrupt the word of God. And we ought not to think that in these days that it's any different. Uh, people are still busy about corrupting the word of God. Now we don't have time to go into a, a, a Bible study, but I'll just tell you this. The King James Bible is the pure, unadulterated, undefiled, incorruptible word of God. Now that can be proven, and we've taught classes on it, preached messages on it, and if you're interested, you can, go, you can come and go to our website. There's information there on it concerning that. But the, the word of God ought to carry some authority with it. Today we have preachers who preach, and they get up there and they say, well, I think, or someone says, well, I believe. You see, it's not what I think or what I believe, but what the Word of God teaches. And so we ought to be able to open up the Word of God and allow the Word of God to speak to our hearts and then not to doubt that Word. The book of James, chapter 1, verses uh, 22, says that, that we ought to not be... We ought to not just be hearers of the word of God, but doers of the word of God, whereby we deceive ourselves. So many who are forgetful of that, those who don't, who hear the word and then don't do it, he says, are deceiving themselves. Self-deception is strong in the church today. People, uh, they, they, they believe that they can go and do anything that they want to do. There's no repercussions to it. But God's word is, is as true today as it was in the day that he gave it. It carries the exact same authority that it has always carried. And when the Bible says, thus saith the Lord, it is what God says it means. God says it means what, what exactly what he wants it to say and mean. It's clear. It's not hard to understand. You just... Read it and believe it as, as he has given it. 
Well, in this parable that he's teaching here concerning the word, he talks about the word or the seed that's being sown, the word of God, falls upon different areas of people's lives, of different kinds of people's lives, I should say. He talks about uh, those that uh, fall upon the uh, wayside or the place where it's a hard beaten down path. Uh, says the fowls of the air devoured it. In other words, it never did get planted where it could grow and produce fruit. So when he's speaking about this word, he is putting the word out, but you are under an uh, obligation then on how that word is received. In other words, they, you can turn in today and you can listen to me ramble on here and listen to, to some of the things that I have to say here. And and then it's the option lies within you as to what you're going to do with it. Whether you're going to allow that word to change your life or whether you're just going to well, you know, that doesn't apply to me. I don't I don't have to, to go that direction. You can make your own decisions. Now, it's interesting in this parable that in this chapter, Jesus teaches on his authority of his word over certain areas. But over the heart of man, he does not force his authority or his word into your life. You have to choose to accept it. Uh, look here what he says says down here. Uh, let me see if I can find it here real quick. In verses 19 through 21. If you have your Bibles, you can read along there with me. Then there came to him his mother and his brethren could not come at him for the press. So there's just too many people hanging around, right? And it was told him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to see thee. And he answered and said, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. You know, there's a lot of people, they struggle with their, their security, their, their relationship with the Lord. The Bible says that it's an amazing love that the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. We... When you get saved, you become a member of the family of God. Jesus says that family, his mother and his brethren, is limited to those who do the word. They hear the word and do it. There's a lot of people who proclaim and profess Christianity who are in church and they listen to the preaching of God's word, but they don't do it. It has no effect upon them. It carries no authority in their life. They choose to do, even though they know what the Word of God says that you're supposed to do, they won't do it because they exert their own authority over it. Well, you know, that doesn't apply to me at this time. People are quick to look and to judge and call other people hypocrites because they examine how their life works and say, well, you know, this person goes to church and, and you know, uh, I hear them, you know, they sing the songs and they would say, praise the Lord, they pray. And and then, you know, Friday night I see them down to bar or I hear them uh, cussing like a sailor or, or, or I, I see them going into places that they're not supposed to be going into. And instead of looking at that person and say, well, is that person living by the authority of the word of God? Or are they exerting their own authority? We just lump them all and call them all hypocrites. And we discount Christianity because it's, it doesn't seem to have applied to their lives. We do that because we like to hide behind our own fig leaves, our own bushes, because we reject the word of God. That's what Adam and Eve did when they fell into sin. They they run, they made themselves clothing. They sewed together the fig leaves. They hid in the bushes when God showed up. They, they were not living under the authority of God's word. They had broke that authority. They knew that. 
But God gives man that choice. Now, through the rest of this chapter, chapter 8 here, Jesus demonstrates his authority in three areas where there is no, no uh, argument. In other words, he has absolute authority and forces that authority upon those areas. Now, let's, let's just look at those three real quick. Then we'll back up. I'm, I'll get down to what I'm going to preach on here in a minute. Uh, but we've got to give, give a little bit of an introduction, right? Now, the first thing we see here in, in happening in chapter 8 is after the teaching of this parable is that Jesus sends his disciples over to the land of, of the uh, Gadarenes and they get in the ship and they go across uh, on the sea and they launch forth. They get over there and they find themselves in a big storm. Jesus, on the other hand, is in the ship asleep. As it says here, they came, they came down a storm, uh, there came down a storm of wind on the lake and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. So here, they're out here in this ship, the boat's filling up with water, they're in jeopardy of going down and drowning here in the midst of this sea. And verse 24 says, And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. And then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And they said unto them, well, Where is your and he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they being afraid wondered, saying one to another. Now this is interesting. What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water, and they obey him. Jesus exercised absolute authority over his creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything in this world, everything within this solar system and on this earth, all operates by his authority. How else can you explain creation? An atheist would, would like to have you believe that all of this, all of the planets and, and our solar system and then the universes and the universes and the universes and the millions and billions of stars all come from nothing. They'd like for you to think that life on this planet came from a rock. They believe that earth crust was a stony, rocky place and then it got moisture on it. Rain and this rain puddled up somewhere and out of that puddle that began that first little amoeba to wiggle and I mean it and from from that then comes all of all of this earth I don't know about you but I've I've been a lot of different places upon this this uh, planet and on this earth and not in some of the most beautiful gorgeous places to think that it came from nothing uh it, it staggers my mind Yet there are people who believe exactly that. But Jesus exercised authority over creation because he is the creator. The Bible says that without him was nothing, nothing made that was made. He, he made everything. He put the stars in their place. He calls all those stars by name. And when he speaks to his creation... It doesn't matter whether it's a windstorm or a raging sea or whether it's a whatever it might be. When he speaks to it, it will accomplish exactly what he wants it to do. So when Moses stands before a a uh, a the Red Sea and uh, he's got an army behind him and the Red Sea in front of him, and what's he going to do? God says, I'll take care of that. So he speaks with that same authority in the waters part, and they go across on dry ground. And when the Egyptians tried to do the same thing, he spoke with the same authority, the waters went back, and they were all destroyed. He has authority over creation. 
Now, you are part of his creation. He created man. Scooped you up out of a pile of dust and he breathed into man. Man became a living soul. God did something very special when he created man. But he created man also with the ability to choose between good and evil, between right and wrong. But man, in his wisdom, decided that God's word didn't really mean what it says. When the serpent tempted Eve, he said, Yea, hath God said? Did he really say that? Did he really mean that? Did he really mean that when you ate of that fruit, you were going to die? You shall not surely die. And for some reason, man chooses to believe the lie rather than the truth. Because they don't and won't put themselves under the authority of the word of God. A real Christian operates with that authority on his life. The second thing we see here is that he uh, exercises authority over the devil. Uh, they came once the ship was, the waters were calmed down and the ship came to land exactly where Jesus wanted to do there in the country of the Gadarenes in verse 26 of chapter 8. Then we have this story uh, concerning this man who is possessed by demons, by, by these devils. And they are uh, tormenting this man's life. And when Jesus gets to the shore, uh, he begins to deal with this man and to deal with those devils. Uh, he commanded them to come out of that, come out of that man. And this man was, was so tormented, uh, his, his fellow men had tried to help him all they could. And they had got him to every psychiatrist, and they took him to every doctor they could find, and when, when none of those things worked, they chained him up because he was such a violent person. That's what it says in verse 29. It says he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he broke the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. Actually, out into a graveyard. This man lived with death all around him. Because that's what, that's, that is what the devil produces in people's lives who won't put themselves in the authority of God. God told Adam and Eve, the day that you eat thereof, you shall die. The devil said, nah, you can, that, that's not going to happen. It did happen. And it happens every day. And it's, and it's still happening. Death still reigns and rules over your life. Uh, I, was, I was talking with one of my friends this morning. We was talking about uh, getting to the church. I said, you know, just a few years ago, I'd have, I'd have thrown my bunny boots on, my parka, and man, I'd have took right off. Wouldn't even thought twice about it. Uh, getting out into the cold and the snow or whatever. I said, I don't know what I'm getting older or getting smarter. He said, well, maybe both. Well, I know I'm getting older. You see, your body ages on you, and you, you get to that part where your body stops producing as many cells as are dying. In other words, you're, the, you're, you, your body's always having dead cells. You you're always have uh, parts of you that are dying, but they're being reproduced. But the older you get, the more of them die and the less of them are reproduced. And so that's the whole aging process, if that made any sense to you. And you shall die. You see, when we believe the devil, the devil brings upon our life and we live in that area of death, in the graveyards of life. Chained up, bound because we won't allow the word of God to set our lives free. <laughs> we tend to think that we know more than God does. And so we become our own gods. 
But Jesus exercised authority over the devil. The devil cannot, cannot exceed the, the authority of Christ. Now that is his desire. You go over to Isaiah uh, chapter, what is it, chapter 14. Uh, and begin to read about his I wills, I will exalt myself, I will exalt myself. He gets to the last, I will, I will exalt myself above the most high, I will be like the most high. He didn't want to be like the most loving God, he wanted to be like the most powerful God. But that scripture goes on and says, thou shalt be brought down to the pits, down to the side of the pits, thou shalt be sent into hell. God has authority over his creation, and the devil's part of that creation. Uh, he is a created being. He's not a god. He's not, he's not uh, able to exert that authority over his creator. It says here this, there was a legion of these devils in him. Uh, it says uh, in verse 30, what is thy name? And, and the devil answered, legion, because there were many devils. This man was being tormented in a lot of different areas of life, just like you are, just without Christ, without being born again, without a new life, the devil brings you into death, into a place where he, he literally is seeking to torment any joy out of your life. He would destroy your life, destroy your family's life. He would destroy your church. He is the destroyer. And so they asked and besought Jesus in verse 31 that he would not command them to go out into the deep. But there was a herd of many swine feeding, and so Jesus sent them into the pigs, and they all run off a cliff into the ocean and drowned. Now it's amazing how people react uh, to the word of God and the authority of God. Now here are these devils. They have to submit to the word of God. When you over and read the book of Revelations, we know that there's going to come a time when God's going to send one of the angels, just one angel, from heaven. He's going to grab a hold of Satan, and he's going to lock him up into the bottomless pit and going to keep him there uh, for, for a, a thousand years. And then he's going to release him for a short period, and then he'll sentence him to the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. You see, the devil is on a short leash. He knows it. And so he seeks to destroy and to devour your life. And the only thing that will exert authority over him in your life is the word of God. When, when Jesus said, he said, you know, that you must be born again. That's not a suggestion, that is a, that is a call to submission to his authority. You must be. You have to be. Because you don't have the ability within yourself, without God, to live the Christian life. And you don't have the ability to change your life. Only God can do that. The Bible says that if any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. All the old things have passed away. The old all things have become new. Second uh, Corinthians five seventeen. So if you want that new life, you have to submit to the authority of God's word in your life. So He exerted authority over His creation, over the wind and the the sea. He creates. He has authority over the devil. And by the way, when he changes a person's life, he changes a person's life. If you read there in chapter 8 where we first started, many of those women had serious, serious problems. But their lives had been changed. And now we find here this, this demoniac whose life uh, had been filled with the devil and death has a, now has a changed life because the authority of God's word is now working upon his heart. Look here. 
Many people came, it says. Uh, they went out uh, to see what was done. They came to Jesus. In verse 35, excuse me. And they found the man out of whom the devils were departed. Now, here it is. Our, we've lost our pig, <laughs> pig herd. And they were more concerned about the pigs than they were about the man. And so they come out there and they're checking the whole situation out. They see Jesus and they see this man. And, and today you see people whose lives have been transformed by the power of God, but unfortunately we're more concerned about the things in our life than we are about the new life. It says, They saw this man of whom the devils were departed, Verse 35, sitting at the feet of Jesus. Man, what a difference. This man who used to sit in the graveyards now sat at the feet of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This man whose life was once swallowed up in death set by him who came to give him eternal life. This man who was once bound with chains and fetters is now free to live for the glory of God. Not only was he sitting at the feet of Jesus, he's in the proper place, but he's now properly clothed. He doesn't look like the world looked at him uh, any longer. Here's a man who ran around the graveyards naked, but he's sitting there at the feet of Jesus with his clothes on. Totally transformed, inside and outside. Somehow or another, we got this idea that, that, that we only need an inside experience. Let me tell you something. You get the word of God on the inside, it will affect your outsides. And then it says, and in his right mind, this man, the devil, had drove, driven him out of his mind. But Jesus gave him a right mind. A mind that would submit to the authority of his word. The authority of God's word in his life. And these people were afraid. Their desire was to get rid of Jesus. And they just told him leave. How many people have got in that close to the authority of word of God in their life and they just tell Jesus not now tomorrow the next day I'll do something later and then the third place of authority Jesus exercised absolute authority over is is over life itself now we go on down here and we, we see as he he deals down there. He's he's on his way, and uh, he he heals this this woman of her physical problems here in in verses forty uh, through uh, forty. Where are we at here? Forty eight. Forty forty eight. But he's on his way to a man by the name of Jairus, Jairus's home, because his daughter is sick, and Jesus is going there to heal him. He has. He has the authority over infirmities. He has authority uh, in, in to do something. This, and so he's going there to do something in this, this woman's life. Or this, this young girl's wife. But while he was yet speaking, there cometh one from one uh, from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter's dead. Trouble not the master. Well, you say, well, Jesus must have messed up. He, he didn't get there in time. Jesus always shows up just in time. He's never late. Uh, you say, well, I've, I've prayed and this didn't happen or that didn't happen. Well, maybe his will was that those things would be accomplished. He said, we don't understand everything. We look at the bottom side of the tapestry and it's all messed up and all we see is a bunch of knots and strings, but on the other side is this picture of life that God is is putting together, and this 
God's hand is always at work, and the Bible says he always does that which is right. Because you don't understand it. We tend to blame him, fall out on him, condemn him, because he didn't do what we thought was right. But whose word carries that authority? You see, there's been a lot of things that I've prayed for and I've asked for that didn't get answered the way that I thought they should. But all I was doing, if, if, if the only thing that God does is answer the way that I'm, I tell him, and I'm commanding God, I'm telling him what's right and what's wrong. I just push him out of his place and I become my own God. He just becomes some little genie that I rub the lamp on and he comes and does my bidding and will. That's not how it works. We're to submit ourselves unto him and unto his authority and unto his will. I don't like that. I know you don't. That's because in our hearts we resist that authority and will of God. Jesus said to Jairus, Fear not, be, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And so he comes to the house. And he finds all these people around her bed. They're weeping. They're wailing. They're mourning. He tells them in verse 52, Weep not, she's not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out. You see, you can either be in on what God's done or you can be out on what God's done. But if you'll trust him and trust the authority of his word, when he tells you something, he knows what he's speaking of. And he put them all out and took her by the hand and called saying, May it arise. And her spirit came again and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat, and her parents were astonished. I reckon so. Jesus exercised authority over his creation. He ex exercises authority over the devil. He also exercises authority over death. I couldn't imagine a more fearful thing than to know that when I breathed my last breath in this world, I would come under the authority of whatever lays on the other side of it without knowing what the Word of God says. But that I mean is, is that the most fearful thing that I know of in the world is, is that unknown. Not knowing what goes on the other side, not knowing what death is all about, not understanding what death is. The Bible tells us the book of James that as, as the body without the spirit is dead, absent, when that spirit is absent from the body, that's when death takes place. It's not the stopping of the heart. It's not even the stopping of the brain. It's when that spirit leaves the body. Now, the Bible's clear that no man has the authority over the Spirit. Only God does. In other words, uh, you know, I, I know of people, and, and, and I won't name any names, but I know of people who attempted suicide because they thought that, that, that death was their best way out. They, they lost despair. They, those de those devils had taken him down to a place like they had this man where he was he was chained up and bound with with hopelessness and helplessness and so he attempted to end that by his own means and uh it failed miserably it failed horribly and uh he wound up with his his face all disfigured and uh in real problems but unfortunately out of all of that you know he didn't die and out of all of that, then he came 
and was saved and his life was transformed to where he went from hopelessness and helplessness to finding out that there's real life. Jesus exercises that authority over death. The thing about death is, is that most people see that as the end of life. And we hear about all, all these people who have died, and we think about people who have died. And uh, We were watching uh, here uh, on the uh, 20th of January, we had our uh, 25th wedding anniversary, and uh, we, we pulled out our old uh, VHS tape and found a VHS player. You know, that's like an ancient thing anymore. And we we played back the video of our wedding. It was amazing to me, as I looked through there, of the number of faces of the people that I know that are no longer with us. Some of them young and some of them were older at that time, but such a huge block of people who were gone. Death rules over man, and it takes us, it takes us some way too early, and and some we we think not soon enough as they suffer with all the things. And there is hope, because death is not the end of it. You are a living soul. Within you, there is eternal life. And when somebody says, you know, well, their life ended or their life come to a stop. That's not true. You're going to live on eternally somewhere, whether you're saved or you're lost. You're either going to live in the eternity that God has prepared for you in salvation, or you're going to live into the eternity that he prepared for the devil and his angels in the eternal flames of fire. But you're going to live on. But God does not force us to accept that word, to accept that truth, to accept his authority over our future eternal being. It's a choice. Look what it says here about the, the parable of the, of the seeds, and then we'll get close to closing here, give you a little bit of head up here. Verse 15. Now he talks about different soils, and he talks about those who's, who's now he's talking about your heart, He's talking about what you're willing to receive into your life. He talks about those who the world has, it's just trodden down. It's, it's just a beaten down path. And in that seed, that word of God never gets into that soil. And so it, it immediately, uh, the birds come and take it away. And he talks about those who hear the word of God and with joy receive it. And they're happy about it. Yeah, that's, you know, that's exactly what I need. But immediately it says that the thorns that's in their life, and the, they grow up and they choke it out. The cares of this world. We get so wrapped up in believing that this temporal world holds more for us than the eternal world that God has coming for us. That we throw away the eternal value of the authority of God in our lives. But look what he says in verse 15. He talks about those that have sown the seed on good ground. Here's what he calls it. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it 
and bring forth fruit with patience. He said, well, girl, how do I know if I'm keeping the word of God? Is your life being changed? Are you like those women here that minister to Jesus? Is it now not your heart's desire? It ought to be your heart's desire for your life to be transformed than to worship him. To minister to the needs of Christ. He said, well, what are the needs of Christ? Well, that tells me that you're not paying much attention to the word of God. It tells us that that we we believe in his authority over certain things of this world. We yeah, he can he can calm the storms and yes, he can you know, he can he could uh come and take care of the devil and yes, he can you know, he can raise the dead and but have I submitted myself to the authority of, of him? Because he won't force that authority upon you. That is your choice. To say, Lord, I understand that by your word, I'm a sinner. I understand that those sins separate me from you. And I understand that if that sin isn't reconciled between me and you, there's a judgment of eternal damnation on my soul. And so man has a choice to accept God's payment for his sin or to try to do something for it himself. You do something for yourself, you're rejecting the authority of his word because the Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. They have all together, all together. You see, when, when God says all, he means all. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You can't reconcile yourself to God. God has to reconcile you to himself. That's the reason he came to this earth. That's the reason he put on that robe of flesh and stepped into this world. That's the reason he went to Calvary, died for your sins. That's the reason he was buried into that tomb, so that he could bring forth life, not just in the resurrection, but in your own life, to transform your life. Romans chapter 6, read it. And to exert the authority over death, eternal damnation, by giving you the ability, by giving you the option to choose life or death. You can choose to accept what he says or reject it. Let's turn over the book of Romans just real quick. Romans chapter 10. It says in verse, um, well, let me, let's let me pick up here. It says here, the, the means of salvation. I just want to give you the whole thing. Let God's word speak to it. You decide. What saith it? What does the word of God say? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him 
shall not be ashamed. For there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the authority of God's word. It's not that you do something. It's not that you stand on your head and wiggle your toes or stand on a street corner and sell flowers or, or peddle papers or anything else. It's that you trust in Jesus Christ and in him alone for salvation. He goes on and says, says in here, uh, but they have not all obeyed, verse 16, not all obeyed the gospel. Have you obeyed? Or have you been like those whose hearts are trodden down with the cares of this world? Who the pleasures and thorns have risen up and choked out the word of God in your life? Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith cometh. It's not just something that you stir up a batch of and drink down a goblet of. It's when you pay attention to the word of God and believe that authority of the word of God in your life. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The authority of God's word in a person's life is only limited to what you allow him to do with it. He'll save your soul, give you eternal life when you submit to his authority. As long as you keep trying to do it on your own power and on your own way, then you'll reap your works, your results, your rewards, which is death. Because the wages of sin is death. When the people heard Jesus speaking, Matthew chapter 7, verse 29, if you want to look over and read that, they were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one having authority, not as the scribes and the Pharisees. They, they did not teach with the authority that Jesus taught with. They still trumped their traditions and their ways and their plans. But Jesus just laid it out like it was. He said, this is life. This is everlasting life. The authority of God's word. I don't know where you're at in that authority. Chapter 8 of Luke. I know that God holds absolute sway over the authority of his creation, over the devils, and over death. But you hold the keys. You hold the means of life in your own heart. He said some of that seed fell on good soil of a heart that is honest and good. A heart that will honestly say that without God's help I don't have any hope. That gives God some place to work where he'll change and transform your life by the authority of his word. Born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. That's the word of God. How about you? Do you know Christ? 
Have you submitted yourself to the authority of God's word? Have you been, have you, have you said, Lord, you know, I'm just tired of trying to do it myself. I'm, I'm tired of trying to, to pick myself up by my own bootstraps. I lived my own way and I've ruined my life and maybe I've ruined my family's life and maybe I'm ruining whatever it is that I'm involved in right now. But I, I can tell you this, Lord, I'm tired of it. I just want you and I want your word, your authority in my life. I submit to the means of salvation of faith and faith alone in Christ Jesus as my only hope of salvation. Now I ask you to bring that word to bear every day upon my life that I might live in a means that shows that transformed life. Lord, I want to be like those ladies that ministered to your needs. Lord, I want to be, I want to be like that, that uh, demoniac, that, that devil driven man whose life was so transformed that people around me can see that I've changed. My life's been transformed by your power. Because I spend time with you. Because my outward life has changed. So I've had that inward heart change. I've had the outward that affected the outward life changed. And Lord, I'm starting to think some right things. Because I'm living according to your word. How about you? You need to make that decision. You need to pray today. Put yourself on the authority of God's word. Let him transform and live in your life so that you may know what life truly is all about. Or right, you can be like it said over there in Romans where we were just at. Lord, who has believed our report? God won't force that decision upon you. You have to make it yourself. Call upon the Lord while he is near. Seek the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. When you find him, you submit to that authority, then you find what life is truly all about. I pray God's blessing upon you. I pray that it will touch your heart today as you understand the importance of this book and of the truth that lies within its pages. God bless you, and God keep you according to his word. Amen.